This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on corporate issuers and the reading on uses of capital. This is actually a paired reading with the next one, which is called sources of capital. Uh, these are new readings which replace capital structure and capital budgeting, but I'm guessing the CFA Institute has taken a less academic and more practical approach to this topic area. I want you to think of this reading, uses of capital, as the stuff that goes on on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. And the next reading, sources of capital, as stuff that goes on on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. And you'll see that as we look through some of these learning outcome statements. Just five of them in this reading. It's a relatively short reading. Uh, clearly, the most important one is that second one, demonstrate the use of net present value and internal rate of return. Now, my interpretation of the action word demonstrate includes um, calculate or compute. So we'll show you a couple of brief calculations so that you can demonstrate uh, NPV and IRR. But we'll begin with capital allocation process, and then we'll go through a couple of really interesting things at the end of the slide deck, including a discussion on real options. And then you might notice there is a theme in a final uh, learning objective in which the Institute asks us as good candidates and financial managers to describe pitfalls. In this case, we have some pitfalls in the capital allocation process. So let's go ahead and describe this process. These are you know, four pretty simple and reasonable and intuitive steps, brainstorm, analyze, uh, plan, and then monitor. And that's probably a good flow chart for any process that we discuss inside of the CFA program. But I wanna take just a few minutes to talk about each one of these steps to kind of give you a sense, a, a broad sense of what kinds of questions that you might be able to expect. So describe the process. So step one is going to be to brainstorm ideas. And I'm always fascinated when I drive my children around uh, our city. We come to an intersection and there's a handful of choices for fast food. And the fast food industry has really evolved. Uh, fast food is probably not the correct description because there's some places where you go, it's not, it's not really fast, uh, but you still get food in a relatively short time period. But I envision these executives and these financial managers, and, and by the way, this occurs with large publicly held corporations all the way down to uh, small businesses run by individuals. You can imagine in this fast food industry, individuals, really smart individuals sitting around thinking, how can we convince Jim to stop at our restaurant when he's sitting at this gigantic intersection, intersection and has four or five different choices? Well, let me offer a suggestion here. But I imagine there are some uh, planners out there who are saying, you know what, there's not enough seafood in, in the fast food industry. I know you can get fish sandwiches and I know you can get shrimp in a taco or, uh, or maybe a burrito. But what I would like is I would like a nice thick haddock broiled sandwich, maybe with some rice on it, maybe some onions and tomatoes. I might pay five or seven bucks for a sandwich like that if I could get it quickly. And so you can imagine you know, these decision makers saying, how can I put this seafood into my product line? Is that going to increase my brand name recognition? And then is it going to increase my profitability, not just today, but in the long term? And that's where we move into step two. So once we have this idea, whether it is a haddock sandwich or a new piece of software or a new hat, or something to do on the sporting field, what we need to do is get out our thinking brains and say, what's going to happen in the future? So that's step two. Analyze and predict the cash flows and profitability of each project. So let's imagine that I'm, uh, you know, I'm Jim's fast food and I'm gonna put together this haddock sandwich. Well, I need to predict those cash flows, not just now, but a year from now or two years or three or four years from now which means I need to know how to estimate revenues, which as you remember from the financial statement analysis readings, it's, it's really just price 
times quantity. Well, that means as good financial managers, we need to know all about pricing and pricing power and competition. We need to know about quantity supplied and quantity demanded just to come up with an estimate of revenues. That's why the Institute, Institute makes us uh, uh, review and master a handful of macro and micro economics readings. And then, of course, you work your way down the cash flow statement or the income statement and, and you get to something called operating cash flow. So you estimate these operating cash flows for one and two and three and four years, however long you think the project is going to last. And then in step three, you have to take a look at the timing of those cash flows. I mean, if I'm Jim's uh, fast food restaurant, I'm going to be selling these haddock at least hopefully I'll be selling these haddock sandwiches every day, but we need to aggregate those cash flows inside of a more broad working capital management strategy so we know how much of those cash flows are going in, how much of those cash flows are going out. And here's a really great question. Are they going to require, is this project going to require additional investments throughout, uh, throughout the time frame? And then, of course, notice step four. There's that key word, continuously monitor the project and audit the financial results because we need to take a look back and say, OK, we had this great idea, the haddock sandwich, and after a year we say, ha has it paid off? And so essentially what we're doing um, intertemporally, we're going to say, all right, we're going to make this huge investment today in being able to produce a haddock sandwich and we're going to get these cash flows at some time in the future marginal costs occur today but they can occur at, at discrete intervals over the time period and those operating cash flows which are the marginal benefits they kind of uh, occur continuously but we're probably going to aggregate them inside of our working capital process all right, how about types of capital projects? This is a really good exam question in which the Institute could, in the question stem, say, hey, here's a bunch of stuff. Uh, what does this sound like? Does it sound like a replacement project? And I think one of the key answers in identifying replacement projects is that they probably don't change the size of the business. So replacing old or worn out equipment with new and more efficient equipment. Remember that doesn't affect the size of the business. It's just a simple old, okay, this machine isn't working very well anymore. Let's go ahead and spend some money today. And maybe that new efficient machine, maybe when we're back here uh, analyzing the cash flows, maybe that more efficient machine is going to incur fewer expenses and because it's more efficient, maybe it's going to be able to generate more revenue. So, of course, that new machine will pay for itself over time. Um, expansion projects, on the other hand, these, of course, will increase the size of the business. Uh, the classic example that I always remember, and I tell my students this all the time, is when I was in graduate school in the early 90s, uh, Michael Dell and Dell Computer expanded their operations into Mexico. And then about 10 years later, uh, it had an additional expansion. And clearly, if you go to the Dell Computer webpage, you see all these product lines on there and they're built all the way throughout the world and they're distributed throughout the world. But if you go back and uh, and read some of the reasoning behind Michael Dell's decision, um, I think it could be summarized by saying, hey, we want the manufacturing process and the servicing and the distribution process much closer to the ultimate customers and consumers, expansion products. Uh, brand new products and services. Uh, the classic example that I always use is going back to the year 2000. One day, Milton Hershey woke up and said, you know what? I'm tired of making chocolate. My breath doesn't smell very well. I'm going to make these ice breakers. And so this was a brand new product line for Hershey Foods, which of course had been making Hershey bars and Hershey kisses, you know, for thousands of years. Of course, I'm exaggerating there. So this was a brand new venture had its own cash flow projections had its own uh, risk management ideas etc cetera, etc cetera. and so i want to go back here to that second step imagine how easy it is and i say that as a relative term 
Imagine how easy it is for Milton Hershey to wake up one day and say, okay, I want to estimate my cash flows for the Hershey Kiss product line. Well, people know Hershey Kisses. They know if Milton Hershey makes these things that we're going to buy them, right? Brand name, all that kind of good stuff. However, icebreakers, I mean, this is an entirely new thing. People would say something like, well, what does Milton Hershey know about? about bad breath. Maybe he has bad breath, but how does he know about solving the problem of having bad breath? I mean, chocolate and cocoa and milk and sugar, they they go into the Hershey Kiss. That doesn't sound like anything into an icebreaker. So this had some interesting risk projections. So keep in mind that brand new products and services might change the risk structure of the business. Uh, projects that have to do with regulations or safety or environments. Let's go back to the early or mid 1970s. I remember my dad coming home saying, hey, I got a car. It has a catalytic converter. This was a new thing and it was uh, it was placed on cars to reduce emissions and to reduce uh, you know, toxic pollution. And so who, who knows? I mean, I'm not a car guy, but I have no idea what the current state of catalytic converters might be, but I'm pretty sure they're efficient uh, compared to what they were back uh, in 1970. So notice our definition there, undertaken to comply with a requirement set by you know some government body or an agency, projects may or may not generate revenue. And that's pretty interesting about the may or may not generate revenue. You know, current uh, current product lines that would fit into this category may or may not are the electric cars that's that is that are produced by the auto manufacturers you know we want to we want to have these electric cars because they're efficient and they can get us from one place to another and they can do it you know as fast as gas powered cars and they're much safer for the environment and we feel good about using these kinds of vehicles but I'm fascinated by the marketing and how the auto manufacturers have taken this as saying, hey, look, you buy our electric car and you're going to be able to do all of these things that you can do with the gas, the traditional gas powered cars uh, and you can do it much more efficiently. So such projects may or may not generate revenue. So the electric car industry may or may not generated extra revenue or extra cash flows initially, but clearly after several years of marketing this and becoming more efficient, they, they certainly do. Uh, how about some other capital projects? Let me swing back to the Milton Hershey. I'm guessing that that uh, icebreaker product line was uh, a much greater risk than Hershey Kisses or Hershey Chocolate Bar. So highly risky projects. Let me just emphasize that cash flows are highly uncertain, difficulty in estimating those future cash flows. But there's a lot of good academic and professional research on pet projects and how pet projects that are advanced by uh, the senior leadership um, have a tendency to, instead of increasing wealth, uh, decreasing wealth of the business. You know, the classic example of a pet project in the oil and gas industry is for executives to uh, go and buy land, you know, somewhere in the middle where there's nobody out there and then try to buy an oil lease for land, let's say somewhere in the middle. And then they use company resources to dig for oil or natural gas right in the middle. And if it works out, then their land values uh, increase over time. That sounds to me like a pet project. Uh, how about two slides worth of capital allocation assumptions. Now, let me just remind you in the old reading, these, these would be called capital budgeting assumptions. So really what we're trying to do is decide whether or not to invest in a new product line. We have this huge initial incremental cost, and then we have these cash flows, incremental cash flows that occur at discrete intervals in the future, these are marginal benefits. So we, we need to use our time value of money principles to make these assumptions. So all of these decisions are going to be made based on some of the assumptions that we'll talk about here in the next uh, two slides. So decisions are based on cash flows. This is super important and not accounting concepts 
We're not going to use net income. We're going to uh, not use intangible costs. We're not going to examine any financial impact that doesn't have a direct effect on cash flows or the risk adjusted um, rate of return that we use to compute present values. Now, the reason this is true is because if you look in any introductory finance textbook, there's always a sentence or two in the first chapter that says something like cash is king. And we're going to show you how to compute operating cash flow. And this is super important because and this is how I explain it to my students. You know, the accountants can come up with a net income and they can, and I always do this here. I don't want to accuse accountants of manipulating the data, but they can massage the data to uh, make certain that the company looks maybe better than it actually does. Cash flows are less able to be manipulated. Timing of cash flows is critical. So that first one, decisions based on the amounts of cash flows, but they're also based on the timing of those cash flows. I mean, think about this. Let's suppose that we buy that piece of property and there's an oil well in the middle and we think the oil is, let's say, 10 feet below the ground. So we bring in a machine that can dig down 10 feet. And when we get down to 10 feet, it's, there's still more rocks or sand or dirt or whatever 10 feet below the ground and we hire a new geologist, uh, a geologist and they come out and say, oh no, it's, it's not 10 feet, it's 10,000 feet under the ground. And so we have to have a bigger digger and all that kind of stuff. And so maybe it'll take us uh, a year or two. So we thought we were gonna get these cash flows back in the relatively near future, but maybe it'll be one or two years down, down the road. Of course, opportunity costs are extremely important. Remember, opportunity costs are those costs that you incur by giving something up. You know, when you, you give up something over here in order to do something over here, um, incremental cash flows that occur with and without the investment. And of course, cash flows have to be analyzed on an after tax basis and go back up to that very first uh, teardrop point. Decisions are based on cash flows. And those cash flows are going to include a tax expense. Financing costs are ignored. This is super important. When we do these estimates of operating cash flows, then nowhere in there are we going to take out interest expense. And the reason that we don't take out interest expense is because we are going to use the yield to maturity on the bond or the yield to maturity on the loan to compute the required rate of return. We're going to call that the weighted average cost of capital in an upcoming reading. And so if we were to count them in the cash flows while counting them in the estimate of the required return, then we would be counting them one too many times. That's why we wrote uh, double counting there. So look at that last teardrop point on this page. This is what I was telling you uh, just a few moments ago. Capital budgeting cash flows are not identical as accounting net income because of the ability of accountants to pick and choose from their um, approved rules and regulations. Uh, sunk costs, we ignore those. Opportunity costs, we already talked about that as the value of the best foregone alternative. Uh, um, of course, we need to consider these externalities, the effects of a project on a, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, for example, the environment. Um, these externalities, that's an economics concept which says something like, all right, we're doing all this stuff in here, but, but we're not operating in a vacuum. There's stuff that flows off and maybe that flows off is a positive externality and, and maybe it is a negative externality. Traditional capital budgeting uh, projects typically involve an initial cost today followed by positive cash flows throughout the life of the project. We'll call those conventional cash flow patterns. An initial cash outflow followed by a series of uninterrupted positive cash inflows, right? But Projects don't necessarily have to be conventional. They can be unconventional in which there is an additional sign change. 
And so imagine my example from a few moments ago, Jim's, uh, Jim's restaurant. You know, suppose I have this big old uh, haddock sandwich and it does really, really well. And after, after two years or three years, I might decide to say, hey, let's do a shrimp sandwich or, or a lobster sandwich. And then I may require a huge capital investment during that second or third year which may turn those cash flows negative. Of course, we don't want negative cash flows going on continuously. We don't want uninterrupted negative cash flows, but there might be one or two moments uh, in the future over the life of this new project where we have to make substantial investments that will turn cash flows from being positive back to being negative. But of course, then the idea is that after they're negative for that year two or three, then in year four and five and six, they flip back not only to being positive, but to being, how about if I describe it as being super positive. And then of course, we're interested in incremental cash flows. All right, back to the very beginning of any business class. What's the goal of the business? You know, when I ask this, uh, the initial day of my class, I get a lot of different answers from students. You know, they may talk about profitability. Uh, they may talk about employment. They may talk about delivering product lines. But, you know, in the end, we get down to who owns the business. Well, it's the owners of the business. And so for publicly held corporations and privately held businesses that have multiple owners, I mean, the, the goal of the business is to maximize shareholder wealth over the long term. And this, of course, is uh, consistent with uh, what Milton Friedman taught us back in the early 1970s. Now, we'll go ahead and spend some good time talking about some other goals, you know, maybe some environmental goals um, and how those environmental goals can be achieved within the broader goal of maximizing shareholder wealth. So the question then becomes, how do we make decisions? I mean, think about it, you know, maximize shareholder wealth over the long term. You know, that's kind of like a, an idea up here that doesn't sound very practical. So the question is, how do we decide which, which projects are going to maximize shareholder wealth and which projects are going to reduce shareholder wealth? Well, let me give you just a quick example. Remember, this is a decision. It's a binomial decision. We're either going to say, yes, we accept, or no, we reject. So the easiest way to do this is to just flip a coin. I mean, we could say, let's heads, we accept the project, tails, we reject the project. But I'm guessing, I'm guessing that lots of shareholders out there wouldn't be willing to pay chief financial officers or any other financial managers, uh, you know, several millions of dollars a year in salary if they're using the coin flipping technique. So we need to find a better technique. And of course, that's what net present value really does for us. Uh, there's the good definition of net present value. It's simply the present value of the future operating cash flows minus any initial investment. So I want you to think of that initial investment as the marginal cost. <laughs> I want you to think of those uh, future cash flows as the marginal benefits, we need to take the present value of those marginal benefits. And the decision rule is to invest in a project only if it has a positive net present value. And this is what we'll learn. And this will uh, be emphasized throughout level one and level two and level three, that net present value is a measure of the change in shareholder wealth. So, of course, we love projects that have positive net present values. Let me give you just a super quick example here before I show you a super quick and simple math example. Suppose I'm Jim and I'm Jim's paper company and I say, hey, I'm going to put together a product line with soft tissue paper. And this soft tissue paper, when you blow your nose, it, oh, it's so soft and it helps you overcome your cold and it helps you recover quick, quicker. That sounds like a positive net present value. Who wouldn't want to buy uh, soft tissue paper? But then on the other hand, suppose I said, hey, let's do sandpaper tissue paper. And when you blow your nose, it rips off your hairs and rips off your skin and et cetera, et cetera. Well, that sounds like a negative net present value project because no one would buy Jim's sandpaper tissue paper. And so those are two extreme examples, right? But now we need this method of 
Well, let me, dare I go back here? It's not too far. Step two, predicting these cash flows and profitability of each project. Clearly, clearly we want to invest in projects that have positive NPVs, which are going to have lots and lots of operating cash flows. All right, so let's take a look at an example. Let's suppose we invest $100 today and we receive $100, I'm sorry, $120 in one year. So let's suppose that we have uh, a required return from our bondholders and our shareholders. The reading calls that an expected return. Let's suppose that's 10%. So let's go ahead and compute the net present value of this particular project. Now look, uh, look in the middle there. The general equation for computing net present value is simply the present value of the cash flows. So we have CFT in the numerator, and of course that CFT could be zero. T could be zero, which means the initial cost. And then we're gonna discount them in year one and two and three and four and five or however long it takes. In this particular example, we have an initial cost of 100. Notice that we've put that in red with a minus sign in front of it. Um, making certain that we know that it is a cash outflow. And by the way, at the risk of offending you, if you have to compute net present value on the exam, make sure that you make that initial cash flow negative. And then notice in blue, we have the 120 divided by one plus the uh, required return, which gives you 1.1. So in the red, those are the marginal costs. In the blue, those are the present value of the marginal benefits, and you get a leftover. A lot of textbooks call that $9.09 .09 a residual. So we're gonna say, therefore, accept. But before we continue on to the next example, what I wanna do is call your attention to the bottom right. There are the entries for the BA2+, and that's just to compute the present value of that future operating cash flow of 120, and we put it in blue down there, 10909. I want to interpret that 10909. So you ready for this? Forget about this particular project, but let's suppose that I came to you and I said, hey, I'm going to pay you $120 a year from now. How much are you willing to pay me today? And if your required return is 10%, you're going to say, hey, Jim, I'm willing to pay you 109.09. .09. You're willing to pay 109.09. .09. But then let's put that in the context of this ex uh, particular example. You look around and you say to yourself, wait a minute, I'm willing to pay 109 for this project, but somebody is only asking me to pay 100. There's that minus 100. So I'm willing to pay 109. Someone's only requiring me to pay 100. Therefore, that residual, that leftover, that $9.09, .09, it represents the difference between what I'm willing to pay and what I'm being asked to pay. And that clearly is a measure of how much better off I am today. Do you see that in net present value? This is why NPV method is so popular because and so efficient and effective in making these capital budgeting decisions because it are you ready for this it explicitly measures the change in shareholder wealth so i'm nine dollars and nine cents off better off than i was before this so what do i say therefore accept now you're not going to use this BA2 plus in this manner. And so what I wanna do is take you through the calculator steps. So let's go ahead and do that. Let me show you how to use the financial calculator, the Texas Instruments. And remember that uh, I was unable to download and show you the actual BA2 plus steps because it's not available for use on my desktop computer at home. <laughs> So let me show you this here. So look at these two buttons here. We're going to use the cash flow button here and we're going to use the NPV button here. So in order to solve for net present value, we need to tell the calculator what those cash flows look like. So hit the CF button, which uh, brings up the CF, CF function. Now notice that I have zero in there, but if you have done a problem previous to this, go ahead and do a second 
clear work and that wipes out any cash flows that you may have entered into the calculator because the last thing you want on the exam is for your calculator to compute an NPV with some cash flows that you entered on a previous problem. All right, so all we're going to do here is say 100, make it negative, and hit enter. And then go to the down button over here, and it says C01, so that's cash flow in period one. So we're just going to do 120 and hit enter, and then go down. And that F01 is the frequency. Like if this were $120 for three years, you could just change that frequency to three. But if you had subsequent cash flows, like I'm going to show you here in just a few moments, you would continue to hit the down arrow button and you would go through the timeline. Just hold off on that for a second. I'll, I'll show you that shortly. So what we've done so far is we've used our CF button to enter our cash flows, right? The initial cost, which is the red, and the one year cash flow, which is the light blue. So now we're going to go over to the NPV function. We're going to hit NPV. And you see that I used to have an old problem in there with 10% interest rate, but let's go ahead and do a 10 and hit enter and then hit down. And it says, hey, there's a net present value equals, but you might be scratching your head. You might be saying, wait a minute, Jim, can't be zero. We know what the answer is. But look, the calculator reminds you right up here. You need to hit the compute button. So there's our nine and nine one. <clears throat> So this is how you'll solve it on the exam, solving for the net present value, because the Institute is not going to ask you to solve for the 10909. It will ask you to solve for net present value. Now, just pause with me here for just a second. Let me put up my favorite calculator. Remember, there's no Hewlett Packard download that I can use here, but this one's super easy. Look underneath the PV function, you have a cash flow zero, and under the payment function, you have a cash flow J. It's a, it's a blue function. So all you're going to do is enter the number and go into the cash flow zero and the cash flow J, and then solve for net present value. And so that should be relatively straightforward. Now, there are some executives out there that like to add another capital budgeting tool to their arsenal in determining whether or not to accept or reject a project. And this extra tool is known as the internal rate of return of a project. And, and here's the question that is being asked when executives use the IRR method. They say something like this. Let's suppose that we have a really weird outcome. What happens if the net present value of a particular project is exactly and precisely zero? And if we can come up with a net present value of zero, the question is, what's the discount rate? That's the internal rate of return. It's the discount rate that equates the cash outflows to the inflows in other words, it's the discount rate that forces the net present value to be zero. So there's a good equation there. We go ahead and do all the same stuff that we did back in the net present value calculations. But notice there's an equal sign there. We force the NPV to be equal to zero. And we solve for the interest rate, which of course is the IRR. Now notice the big difference here between that equation, notice we're dividing by 1 plus R, which is the expected return on the assets or the required return on the assets. We're going to call it the weighted average cost of capital here in a few readings. But that is the required return. But notice we divide in this example by the actual internal rate of return. And so notice the last part of that LOS, describe the advantages and disadvantages of each method. And here's a great answer to an exam question, right? The net present value method assumes the cash flows are reinvested at the required return on assets. This is a super reasonable assumption. You ready for this one? The internal rate of return method assumes the cash flows are reinvested at the internal rate of return, which may or may not be reasonable. In fact, there are lots of examples in which 
one can compute the net present value of a project that turns out to be positive, and maybe that required return is around 10%. But when one calculates the internal rate of return, maybe that internal rate of return turns out to be 25% or so. So this reinvestment rate assumption is a huge difference between the NPV method and the IRR method, and it is one of the great disadvantages of the IRR method. That's why most academics and practitioners will make the following conclusion. They'll say something like, look, when you use net present value, you always make decisions that maximize the value of the firm. When you use the internal rate of return method, you may make decisions that maximize the value of the firm, but you will always make decisions that increase the value of the firm. And so the basic difference is that NPV always maximizes, IRR always increases, and that could lead to some confusion about which projects to accept, especially under mutual exclusivity. But I think that conversation is for a later day. So now let's go ahead and pretend that we're describing standalone projects and our decision rule is going to be the following. We're gonna accept any project that has an IRR that is greater than the required rate of return. Now for standalone projects, the IRR will always be greater than the required rate of return when the net present value of the project is positive. So here's a good lesson, right? NPV and IRR methods will always lead to the same decision when evaluating independent or standalone projects. When we get to mutual exclusive projects, then we run into a problem. And so remember this, the disadvantage of using IRR only occurs when projects are mutually exclusive. So let's go ahead and work through an example. Let's suppose um, that in year zero, we have a cash outflow of 100, and then we're going to expect to get 55 and 85 uh, over the next two years. And notice in this example, we're using that term, the weighted average cost of capital is 6%. So that's analogous to the required rate of return on the assets. Now let's remind ourselves of that general form. So we're gonna force the cash flows to be equal to zero. So look down at that second equation. So we have a minus 100 plus 55 plus 85, and we're gonna discount them at the internal rate of return. We're gonna force the net present value to be zero. And so let me go ahead and warn you, you may use the trial and error method until you get the correct result, but oh, goodness gracious, Please don't ever use trial and error, especially uh, on the level one exam, because you may try and error thousands of times before you get the correct answer. No, of course, you're just gonna use the financial calculator. And there are the calculator strokes uh, for the BA2+. Plus, and I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to enter those on the calculator. First step is to hit the CF button and oh remember to do this do a second clear work to wipe out that minus 100 and the 120 that we just entered there a few moments ago so cash flow zero we're going to do the same well it's the same one so we get away with uh, that minus 100 then we'll hit the down button so what was that that was 55 in year one so hit enter and then down frequency is just one we're only getting the 55 one time so let's hit our down button again cash flow 2 is 85 let's hit enter and hit down and frequency is uh, just one so now all we have to do is come over here and hit the IRR button and you may be tempted to say wait a minute Jim IRR zero percent how can that be but once again reminding you of hit the compute button. So let me hit compute and there we go, 23.709%. So what do we do? We say, wasn't that weighted average cost of capital or that required return 6%? So 23.7% 
is greater than six, therefore we accept. So remember those two decision rules, accept positive NPV projects, accept projects whose IRR exceeds the weighted average cost of capital or the required rate of return. Describe expected relations among investments, value, and share price. Boy, haven't I said this throughout this slide deck, right? What happens when the senior leadership team announces an investment in a positive net present value project? And by the way, if you happen to watch any of the business news channels on television, if any, anybody watches TV anymore, um, you'll never hear an executive come on and say, hey, we found a positive net present value project. No, no, no. You will hear them say, we have found a wealth increasing project. Oh, that sounds way better than nobody knows what positive NPV is. So, of course, of course, if we're willing to pay 109 for that first project and someone's only asking us to pay 100 for that first project and that $9.09 represents an immediate increase in our wealth, then of course, the price of the share of stock has to go up by $9.09 divided by the number of outstanding shares or the number of uh, owners. Now look at that second paragraph there. In practice, comma, however, there's always a good line when you have a however in there. The effect of a project on both company value and share price hinges on the expectations among investors. And so let me summarize this. Look, when Milton Hershey announced in 2000 that he was going to invest in breath mints, the stock price reaction was generally positive because investors said something like, you know, even though Milton Hershey might not know much about fresh breath, he knows a lot about chocolate. He knows a lot about Hershey Kisses. He knows a lot about the manufacturing. He knows a lot about distribution and marketing. We're betting that he's going to figure it out, okay? So the expectations among investors, there's a much more positive link to stock price if the brand name of Hershey Kisses can be translated into the brand name of Icebreakers, which of course, you know, the Icebreakers is now the premier brand name. Of course, there are different kinds of Icebreakers. There's even Icebreakers gum. But if I were Jim and I was just Jim somebody other company and I said, hey, I'm going to use, I'm going to come up with a breath mint, you know, boy, people would say, what do you know, Jim, right? So, ah, look at that last arrow point. A company's project may have a positive expected NPV, but if the profitability falls short. So bear in mind that, that when Milton Urshie announced in 2000, you know, icebreakers, then those analysts a year later, maybe six months later, maybe 18 months later, they were saying something like, all right, you told us about this positive NPV, show it to us, prove it to us. And so, of course, this is why we have quarterly earnings reports. And you can see right on that earnings report. And from that earnings report, you can take a look at the cash flow. You can say, OK, Milton Hershey told us the company was going to be this much better off. And 18 months later, it's, oh, my God, how about this much better off? Man, we better run down to the New York Stock Exchange and bid up the price of those shares. However, if Milton Hershey is this much better off, suppose nobody buys would have bought those uh, icebreakers, then of course the stock price is going to fall. So that's a key answer point with this LOS, you know, relations. Of course, if, if NPV is positive, stock price ought to go up, but then it's the executive's job to convince the, invest, convince the investing public that the net present value is positive and then prove it over time with those quarterly earnings reports. This is one of my favorite uh, LOSs inside of this reading. Tell me about real options. Real means uh, not financial options like, like a stock option. Real options means an option on a piece of physical equipment. And so notice the definition. This is taken right out of the reading allows the managers to make decisions in the future that can impact uh, the value of investment decisions made today. So a real option 
looks just like a financial option in which the executive has the right, but not the obligation to make a decision sometime in the future. And there are a handful of these real options. And so a great question would be for the Institute to give you a paragraph describing this option. And then you have to identify it as being either timing, sizing, flexibility, or fundamental. And so the timing options really is just uh, an example in which we can delay an investment now to some better time period in the future when we're better prepared. And the reading mentions something like gathering information during that interim time period so that we can make a more efficient decision in six months or 12 months. You know, a classic example is, uh, is a senior leadership team uh, interviewing a potential employee. And let me give you the details of this potential employee. You know, this employee graduated from a, a well-known college with straight A's. Of course, that means that he or she was on the dean's list all the time. Turns out this student uh, was a Rhodes Scholar and this student had a double major and this student, you know, did some publications. So this is like the ideal, the ideal employee. And so this, you get the sense that, OK, we're going to go ahead and hire this employee and have this employee come in and just visit with everybody in the company and then have this individual go sit in his or her office for a couple of days and say, OK, I have figured stuff out that I've learned and uh, let me help you out with this area. And so we hire someone today with the knowledge and the expectations that they're going to add value uh, to the company at some time in the future. Sizing options, of course, the idea of expansion that falls into this one, we can grow. Uh, think about uh, think about what you're, you know, what you guys are maybe even watching this on. Are you watching it on some kind of a smartphone, right? You know, the iPhone is a direct result of um, this company investing in, boy, the i, the iPad, or maybe even the iPod. I mean, when the iPod came out, I bought that thing and immediately so that I could have a thousand songs right there at my at my hand. But I didn't know that that iPod was going to turn into was going to turn into an iPhone, you know, 10 years later, however long it, or however long it took. But we have the uh, sizing option to grow and we have the option to abandon. Right. We can cut our losses and abandon a project. And this happens in the fast food industry all the time. Remember, there is no such thing as a McPizza right now. There used to be, but there there isn't any more. At least in any of those places that I go to. Uh, flexibility options, change operations, such as increasing the prices of goods. Oh, well, this is super important here, right? The price of our goods and or services. This has everything to do with branding. So what's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. How do we do this? Well, we, we try to develop projects and product lines that are going to have a brand name so that we may be able to influence uh, some uh, purchasing power, some pricing power on not only the manufacturer of goods, but ultimately how they reach the consumer. And then, of course, this is a traditional flexibility option, having additional shifts to meet additional demand, right? So we start out small. That's why a lot of companies will say, OK, we're going to introduce this project and this product line over here in one state like Illinois. Let's suppose we're going to introduce a new kind of a potato chip. And if it does really well in Illinois, then we'll expand to surrounding states. And if we surround those states with more potato chips, well, we're going to have to hire more people and put them on additional shifts. So maybe instead of working just one eight hour shift a day, we can work two or three eight hour shifts a day. And then fundamental options. Uh, these are kind of a general idea of an option changes its investments decision based on future events. And, <clears throat> and those future events could be unique or specific to the firm or the industry, or they could be general to the economy. And then they could be general to the political nature of the elections and outcomes of elections. And how about this last one, uh, pitfalls here, common 
uh, capital allocation pitfalls, but we have a bunch of circles in there. So I would make sure that I know all these. In fact, this is probably a, a good idea to take out your phone and take a picture of this one so you have it uh, to memorize. Uh, failure to factor in economic responses into the investment analysis, right? If I'm, if I'm Milton Hershey and I have this new icebreaker, well, what might that do? Well, icebreakers are probably not going to cannibalize um, the consumption of Hershey Kisses, but, but we might be able to piggyback or leapfrog or springboard by using those too. So we want to factor in economic responses that are both positive and or negative. Pet projects, we talked about there. Basing investment decisions on IRR. So remember what I said, that if you use IRR, you're always going to <clears throat> make decisions that, that increase wealth but you may not always make decisions that maximize wealth. And it's all because of that reinvestment rate assumption. Misestimating overhead costs. I mean, this is a huge one, but that's why we hire really smart individuals so that they have experience in, you know, electricity and air conditioning and refrigeration and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, misusing capital allocation templates. I mean, this is an obvious notion there. Look, we don't want to use EPS. We don't want to use net income. We don't want to use our ROE. We want to use either operating cash flows, which is the term I've used uh, so far this semester, or I'm sorry, so far this, uh, this slide deck, or sometimes we can use free cash flows in there if we know what those future investment opportunities uh, are going to be. So look at that next one, incorrectly accounting for cash flow. So this is a big one here. We're going to we're going to be aware that we use cash flow. So we still have revenues, we still have expenses, but we're going to use cash revenues and cash expenses. And we're going to have a less of an ability to manipulate or massage that data. Now we're going to look at that last middle one on the right uh, going through future readings. So we talked about a risk adjusting discount rate. So we're going to have to take into consider different kinds of risks out there. I won't give you those details now, but there are risks that we need to consider and we need to incorporate them into our discount rate. So we need to make certain that we use an appropriate risk, adjust, uh, risk adjusted discount rate. Uh, capital allocation, this is, these are part of those steps. So we know the timing of those cash flows and then we misallocate. That's a big uh, pitfall. Failure to consider investment alternatives. I think we talked about that with opportunity costs and then sunk costs as well. I think that takes us through all of our LOSs. Uh, these five are super important, but if you know NPV and IRR, then the rest of them kind of fall into place with the exception of the real options. So make sure you study those real options as well.